to the, the organizers for inviting me here today. So I'm going to be talking about the mathematical models, how we use them to predict the future, and also how these models uh, affect the future. Um, I'm from Canada originally, so I guess there are some shared cultural references. Uh, I like this quote from the Canadian hockey player, Wayne Gretzky, a good player plays where the puck is, a great player plays where the puck is going to be. And I think this really captures our eternal desire to look into the future, to see what's coming around the corner so that we can posi position ourselves better for it. Um, on the other hand, there is also this quote attributed to Yogi Berra, baseball player. Prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. So one of the things I want to talk about is, is, is the limits of prediction. And I'll, I'll start off with three examples from, from different areas. So the first one has to do with weather or climate forecasting. Uh, a bit over 30 years ago, they had the first conference to assess the effect of what would happen if the CO2 levels in the atmosphere doubled. And back then, there were only two models, and, and the first one gave an answer of two degrees, the second one gave an answer of four degrees. And so they split the difference and added a fudge factor, and they came up with this uh, range of 1.5 to 4.5 degrees centigrade. So the strange thing is that, you know, in, in the last three decades, um, this uncertainty hasn't got any smaller. And in fact, some model sensitivity studies suggest that it's actually bigger. So this is, this is rather weird. You know, why is it that, you know, with computers so much better, better technology, this uncertainty hasn't got smaller? And, and not to mention the, you know, in, increased evidence that the climate actually is changing as we're watching. Perhaps the most uh, graphic example of our difficulties in predicting the future was the recent financial crisis, which uh, was not widely predicted. And then finally, the area that uh, I work a lot in now, biology. Um, a bit over 10 years ago, the Human Genome Project gave us access to the Book of Life, but it's turned out to be a bit of a puzzler. Um, it's uh, still very hard to, to figure out what the effect of a drug will be. The cost of developing successful drugs has actually soared to over a billion dollars. And we still can't predict the spread of pandemics like avian flu or swine flu. So this is all rather frustrating for, you know, for a mathematical modeler. And what's going on? Are these problems related? Well, I think they are. And I think they're connected with our, our way of, our worldview, our way of thinking about the future. So um, to, uh, what I'm going to do is give a, a very brief history of, of how we make predictions and, and, you know, historically and, and in these different areas. So the first people to build mathematical models for predictive purposes were, were the ancient Greeks. They developed predictive models of the cosmos, and these were used primarily for astrology. Um, and, and these models were based on two very important assumptions. Both of them were wrong, but that didn't really matter. The first was that everything moved around the Earth. And the second was that everything moved in circles. And this is, you know, circles were, the reason they were chosen was, was they were considered the most stable and symmetric of forms. And one of the, the themes of this conference is uh, science and art. And actually, aesthetics has played a very important role in uh, predictive models as well. Uh, so this circle-based model worked okay for things like the, the sun and the moon, which just went around the Earth, but uh, planets appear to follow a more complicated path where they're going to reverse and then keep going, and so to model that required the use of epicycle circles moving around larger circles. Um, and so then the final model by Ptolemy, it, uh, it was very successful. It became the official model of the church. It remained unquestioned right up until the Renaissance. So why did it last for such a long time? Well. The reason was that it could predict things, right? It could predict stuff like this, uh, lunar eclipses, to a very high degree of accuracy. And, you know, in a time when it was believed that uh, affairs here on Earth were ruled by what was going on in the cosmos, this was an astonishing demonstration of the power of mathematics. So then, um, eventually, the, the Greek circle model finally got replaced when, when Isaac Newton came along. He combined Kepler's theory of planetary motion, Galileo's study of uh, falling objects, and he came up with his uh, law of gravity, which uh, replaced circles with equations, and Newton believed that matter was made up of solid, massy, hard particles governed by physical laws, i.e. atoms, and this, this laid out a, a program which science has continued to follow until the present day. So to understand a system, you just break it down into its separate components, you figure out the physical laws that supposedly rule each of these components, express as mathematical equations, and solve. And that's what we do in these different areas, such as weather, economics or health. But how's it actually working? Well, in um, numerical weather forecasting, it became, it really got going after the Second World War in the, in the 1950s with the development of uh, computers such as ENIAC here. 
And soon researchers were producing these big 3D general circulation models of the atmosphere, which were based on the equations of fluid flow. Uh, much of this research was actually funded by the military uh, in the hope of predicting and even possibly controlling the weather. But, um, you know, as we know, uh, while feather weather forecasting has certainly improved a, a great deal, uh, you know, it's, it's still far from perfect. And this is despite there being huge advances in computing. I mean, com supercomputers today are like a million times faster than the ENIAC computer. Uh, observational power such as weather satellites, huge demand. Forecasting hasn't improved as much as anticipated. So predictions are good for a, a few days, but things like precipitation, very hard to predict. Extreme events such as storms. And uh, of course, controlling the weather seems to be right out. So why is it the forecasts haven't improved more? Well, in the 1960s, the butterfly effect became a popular explanation for the inaccuracy of weather forecasts. So this is the idea that if uh, you, know, you get a small disturbance on one side of the world, it creates, it kind of ripples through through chaos and creates a storm. But I always thought this was a, a very strange theory, actually. Because you know, when you think about it, if you flap your hand in front of your face, you don't get the feeling that there's some sort of exponential force rippling out from you, which is going to change the world. And I think there's actually a much simpler explanation for this, uh, perhaps not as nice, but it's just model error, right? Which is, uh, w when you try to model a complex system like the atmosphere, there are at least two major problems. The first is emergent properties. So local effects in complex systems lead to emergent properties that by definition cannot be reduced to simple physical laws. So an example for this is clouds, and these are formed when water droplets locally cluster around small particles in the air, such as dust or salt. So there, there is no law or equation for a cloud, right? These, these equations of, of fluid flow do not, they break down under those circumstances, and all you can do is, is approximate it very roughly. Uh, secondly, complex systems are dominated by nesting and opposing positive and negative feedback loops. So as an example of feedback loops, for clouds again. Heat increases va water vapor, which increases cloud cover, and this cools the atmosphere, so that's negative feedback on heat, except at night when it does the opposite and heats the atmosphere, which is positive feedback. So these forces are in a delicate balance, which makes model sense to small changes. And you, you see a similar problems when you're modeling and predicting other kinds of complex systems. So for example, in biological systems, you have positive feedback, which allows for rapid response, negative feedback, which provides control coupled together. In the stock market, you have momentum buyers versus value investors. So this, I think uh, Heraclitus, uh, the Greek philosopher, put it best when we talked about this harmony of opposite tensions, right? So that the apparent stability is actually a truce between strong opposing forces, which means that the situation can change suddenly as in earthquakes or financial crashes. So how about economics and, and business? Well, economic forecasting has actually followed a rather similar path as uh, weather forecasting. So the orthodox neoclassical theory uh, was developed in the 19th century. It was inspired by Newton's rational mechanics. But is the economy like a machine? Do people behave like atoms? Well, uh, Newton didn't think so. As he, as he wrote in 1721, after he lost most of his fortune in the South Sea bubble, I can calculate the motions of heavenly bodies, but not the madness of people. So orthodox theory, uh, you know, nonetheless, uh, continued going. And, uh, if you recall, I mentioned that the, the Greeks, the assumptions behind the, the models of the Greek models of the cosmos were very important, circles and so on. And uh, neoclassical economics theory also makes the same, you know, some strong assumptions about people. So the, the theory assumes that individuals who are, are the atom of the economy act independently and rationally to maximize their own utility. So this led to the idea of rational economic man. Everyone knows it's a caricature, but it's been a very influential one, as I'll show later. And uh, then Adam Smith's invisible hand drives the economy to a stable equilibrium, so everything is nice and, and still. But these assumptions were used to build general equilibrium models to predict the economic weather, but it's turned out that this is even harder to predict than the real weather. So this graph shows uh, uh, changes in gross domestic product in the United States, the big solid line, and then the forecast from the Department of Energy. And actually, you know, Economic forecasts, especially for that kind of time span out, really are not much better than random. But in the 1960s, uh, again, a little bit like with the butterfly effect, an excuse came along. The efficient market hypothesis became a popular explanation 
for why forecasts go wrong. And this is a physics-inspired theory, which assumes that price changes are random perturbations to an optimal steady state, so markets cannot be predicted. But according to this theory, you can still calculate the risk based on the normal distribution or bell curve, which uh, is a, allows you to express the, uh, the risk of an asset by a single number. Uh, which is very convenient, and this led to all sorts of formulas such as Black Scholes, Gaussian copula value at risk, these, these risk uh, um, uh, forecasting techniques which played a very big role in the recent financial crisis, as it turns out. So do these mechanistic assumptions stand up? Why is it that economic storms still come as a surprise? Well, if you look at some of these assumptions that we're making in our forecasting models here, a theory assumes that the invisible hand drives the economy to a stable equilibrium. But you know, if you look at an asset like gold, you can see that at least since it was released uh, to, to markets, it hasn't been very stable. And this is something that we can understand from nonlinear dynamics, which says that stability is a property of certain very special systems. But something like gold, you know, the reason that you buy gold is because y you think or hope it's going to go up in value, right? So if it's going up in value, we all get excited and we buy more, and that drives the price up further, so that's a positive feedback. And then kind of the same thing in reverse on the way down again. And this leads to this characteristic boom-bust behavior, uh, which you also see in other assets such as oil. Um, oil is often called the lifeblood of the economy, but back in 2008, it looked like we were having a cardiac event with this, this huge spike. The, the forecast here, the dashed lines, are again from the Department of Energy. So this kind of unpredictability, you can say, well, okay, it's consistent with the idea of our efficient markets, our, our model of the economy, but it doesn't prove it. I mean, if you think, you know, this link between efficiency and, and unpredictability, I mean, snowstorms are un unpredictable, but no one says that they're efficient. But the theory also says a lot of other stuff about price changes being small, random, independent, and so on. But as we know, this, isn't, this doesn't describe the economy. The, the fact is that large changes frequently occur, as in September 2008, when it was nearly lights out for the economy. And the reason is that statistics are not normal. They're actually, they follow something called a power law distribution, which is identical to what you see with earthquakes, okay? So it means that, you know, just as you have lots of small tremors in the earth and most of them you don't feel, and then every now and then, but there's always a possibility of a, of a huge extreme event. It's the same with financial crashes. They, most of them, you know, most price changes in the market are very small, but every now and then there's always this possibility of an extreme event. They're not normal. <laughs> And finally, you know, the theory assumes that people act independently, make rational decisions to optimize their own utility. Proof of market equilibrium actually assumed infinite computational capacity and the ability to look into the future. Uh, rational expectation theory is, is, this is a little bit like we're modeling ourselves as if we're as omnipotent as the all-seeing eye which adorns the back of every U.S. dollar bill. But as we know, the, the truth is actually a bit more like this, right? That we're all prey to uh, emotions, especially during something like a financial crash. So just to sort of stand back and look at this, uh, the, the way that we're modeling ourselves, the, uh, you know, the, the economy, the world system, our orthodox theory and forecasting tools are based on these ideas of stability, symmetry, order, and logic, which go back to the ancient Greeks. We model people as if they were perfectly rational and can look into the future. We model the economy as if it obeyed the harmony of the spheres. But it's far more wild than that, right? You know, uh, the same goes for the climate. The, the climate system is a wild system. We are far, far more wild than that. So we're, we're doing something a little bit like what the Greeks were doing. Because when, they, when the Greeks modeled everything with circles, they were, they were kind of making an aesthetic statement. They were, they were projecting their aesthetic values onto the universe and saying, you know, that, that's the way it is. Um, but there's one important difference, which is that the Greek models could predict when the lights were going to go out, right? And, and we can't do that. Our models don't have that predictive validity to them. Okay, so what are we going to do? Well, do we need another Newton or, or just a new approach? Well, I think there, there are new ideas coming from the life sciences, which is a, gives us a very different way of thinking about the future. So. The, the idea is to go from seeing the world as a machine, kind of a Newtonian machine, to seeing it as a living organism. And uh, just to go through some of the properties, so complex organic systems from a living cell to a society to the Earth's atmosphere are characterized by emergent properties. Uh, these systems operate at a state that's far from equilibrium rather than static. The only, in biology, the only things that are stable are dead. Systems exhibit uh, 
power law as opposed to normal statistics, network dynamics as opposed to individualistic atomic dynamics. There are these opposing positive and negative feedback loops create an internal dynamic tension. And all of this results in inherent uncertainty, which means that mechanistic models which attempt to capture these effects tend to be highly unstable and not very good at predicting the future. So in, in recent uh, years, new mathematical techniques have been developed to, to, to work with these systems. And these include things like network theory, nonlinear dynamics, agent-based models. This uh, figure at the, uh, the bottom is an agent-based model of a, of a growing tumor, so the agents here are individual cells. Uh, similar methods are now being used in economics to simulate things like the, the banking system. Um, but back to the question of prediction, you know, if, it sort of raises the question, if we can't predict something like the economic crisis, what about an environmental crisis, which is of a scale which is likely to, you know, definitely affect the way the world looks in 100 years' time? And I think what we have to acknowledge is that prediction is possible for some situations, but we, we need to acknowledge this uncertainty of living systems. And, and here the, the medical analogy is perhaps appropriate. Uh, doctors routinely assess health and provide advice without trying to make specifically timed catastrophic events such as a heart attack, but they can still give general advice. And I think in the same way we can use models and data to improve system health and explore future scenarios. So in scenario forecasting, you don't try to say, okay, the future is going to be like this. What you do is you draw a few alternative different scenarios to kind of prepare yourself mentally for them. So can we predict the exact timing of the next crisis or opportunity? No. But can we use available tools to better prepare ourselves and make our businesses and institutions more flexible and robust? Yes, I think we can. And one way to do that is to compare these different kinds of systems. So the, you know, which of these is better regulated, right? The, the financial system, at least in countries like the US and the UK, has been systematically kind of deregulated in, in recent decades and it's become quite unstable. Uh, human cells are, are usually extremely uh, closely regulated for everything from you know, salinity, temperature, everything. Uh, this is actually a prostate cancer cell, which means that it has escaped regulation and, and therefore has become a threat. And then finally, there's the biosphere, which has been around for a couple of billion years. So I think we can learn from that. All right, so just to, you know, what does this mean? I think perhaps the, the main message is that our, our forecasting model, you know, we kind of see them as being independent and objective and so on, but actually our forecasting models reflect all sorts of cultural and aesthetic values. And because of that, they also affect our future, right? You know, the way that we see the world is what, is what shapes the world. Um, so I, I, I see that uh, this sort of scenario forecasting idea, I see that there as being really two main scenarios. Uh, scenario A, we learn to see the world as a robust but unpredictable living system rather than an inert machine and learn to live within its bounds. Or scenario B, we don't. Okay. Thanks very much.